Okay, y'all are way too quiet. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? If you're great, give me a smile. Good. Some big smiles out there. All right. Welcome this morning. If you happen to be a visitor, welcome again. You get double welcome. And if you are a visitor, we would love for you to fill out our information flappy sheet of paper in the bulletin. It's in the back, and it flaps like so. You fill it out, rip it out, fold it up, and put it in the offering plate when it comes your way in a few minutes. Just want to have a record of your visit. The rest of you grab your bulletins along with them. Now, there's a lot of stuff that you need to read. So I'm just giving you a warning. There might be a pop quiz next Sunday morning. So read over this stuff. Very important stuff. Um, but let me just highlight a few things. Right after the service this morning, we have our, the youth, our St. Patrick's Day fundraiser dinner. Now, I have 25 plates available, and I know a lot of you weren't able to sign up or forgot. <clears throat> I understand. So please see me. I have the list, and I have a pen, and I'm ready to write down names, okay? So we need to get rid of that food, okay? All right, and then tonight, make sure that you come back at 6 o'clock because we have our quarterly church council meeting, and we have our committee workshop, committee chairperson workshop. So that is at 6 o'clock tonight. And Wednesday night, we have service at 6.30. So I hope that you decide to come to that. And one last thing that's not in the bulletin, I don't believe, but the Pleasant Valley Athletic Booster Club 23rd Annual Benefit Banquet is this Saturday. Now, if you're interested in this, you need to see the tall, well, well, he's a little tall. Mr. McAllister, raise your hand. Oh, he just touched the chandelier. Mr. McAllister, <laughs> he has all this information, so please see him if you want to do that this Saturday. All right, and before we greet and hug and love on each other, my father, Randy Haynes, has something. So come on up here. You have the Haynes duet today. Uh, Today is, if you've noticed in your bulletin, is Sunday School's promotion day nights, and we're not promoting you to the next grade, okay? This is, we're promoting Sunday School. We have a wonderful Sunday School here at, at Williams Baptist Church, and we'd love for you that don't attend, we would love for you to come. So today, before you leave, you're going to get a personal invitation to Sunday School. Um, we're going to bring the teachers down, those that are here. I know some of them are out today because of situations, but we're going to ask all of our Sunday school teachers to come forward. Uh, Lori McFall, she's in the nursery. Okay, that's good. I'm glad she's there. Stacy Bonds, I think she's with Rory. Uh, I think Rory, didn't he have a gout attack yesterday? Ugh. I'm telling you. Uh, Patsy, come on. She's the, she's the sub. Um, Carrie Haynes, come on. You're in a substitute. Uh, Angie Stewart. Hmm? Oh, she's cooking, okay. <laughs> Stacy Porter? Cooking. cooking. Okay, Cheryl Green? If she's cooking, I'm going to cook. Okay. If you're cooking, I'm going to cook, okay. Uh, Leanne Hamby? Come on, Leanne. I know you're, I know you're bashful, but come on anyway. Um, let's see. Camille, where are you? Is she cooking? Okay. Uh, Jeannie Floyd? Mary Oliver, Darren Hamby, Rhonda Duncan, Ty Green, Alan Boozer, Pansy Hamby, I mean Peggy Hamby, Pansy Hamby, how about that, just made a new one. We have a new member, Pansy Hamby's here today. Peggy, uh, Eva, come on, you're a substitute, you're on the list. <laughs> Dean Norton, hooray Miss Norton, come on. Wanda. Wanda Green, Doug Ponder, I'm already up here, I'm his assistant, so Allison Quinn, Audrey Freeman, and Jim Justice, he may be at home with Shirley, is she here? Oh, he's here, okay, and Shirley's here, great to see you, I'm glad you're here, because the last time I saw her, she didn't look real good, I'm just telling you, I'm glad she looks good today. These are our Sunday school teachers, and they teach from, from the bed babies 
all the way to the uh, men 62 and up. These would be the Sunday school teachers or the substitutes that you would have if you came to visit, on, visit us in Sunday school. We would love to have you. We're going to start promoting Sunday school every Sunday. We would like for you to come and be a part of our Sunday school program. Now this morning, I would like to have a prayer of dedication for these Sunday school teachers and for our Sunday school. So I would ask you if you would please stand. First, I want to thank these that teach every Sunday morning, those that substitute, because it's a tough job. I guarantee you, I know when I have to fill in for Doug, I have to try to fill in for his shoes, and boy, that's a, that's a tough situation. But I'm thankful for each one of these. I'm thankful for you, and I ask you to come next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. It says on the back, you're invited. So every time you see this, you just lay it around the house, and every time you look at this, and this one is Auburn colors for all of you Auburn people, um, you're invited, 9 to 10 a.m. That's when Sunday school starts. Starts at 9. If you don't know where to come, you don't know where to go, come and find one of us. I'll be out roaming around some of us, and we'll show you where to go. But we would love to have you come to Sunday school. We'd love to have you a part of our Sunday school. We were talking about in, in Sunday school this morning that a lot of things go on in Sunday school that we learn and we talk about different things, and it helps us take it outside these doors and tell people about Jesus Christ and about his love and his care for each one of us. And thank you for being with us this morning, and thank you as we pray. And I'm going to ask Brother Mike if he'll come and have our prayer of dedication for our Sunday school. Good. I was noticing before I pray, I was noticing that some of the substitutes said, oh, I'm a sub. <laughs> so surprise, you get to learn <laughs> that you're a sub. But you know what, what made me think is how faithful our teachers are, that, that they're there almost every Sunday. And I appreciate that, their dedication. All of you who are standing here, your dedication to study, to prepare, to be present, to love, and to care for the members of your Sunday school class. And we really do hope that all of you will take advantage of one of the great ministries of our church at Sunday school. If you don't go, uh, they would welcome you with open arms. We would love for you to do that. And we will have someone here on Sunday mornings that will direct you to the class where you could go and, uh, and help you find where you need to be. Okay? Yeah. Mary Jane Davis, can you help us, Stacy? Can you fill in? You did? Jamie, come on down. Jamie. She, came, she called me while I was at Jefferson yesterday eating hamburger, so, you know, that was on my mind a little different. Sunday school wasn't on your mind, was it? Well, it was until I ate the first five of the hamburger. <laughs> All right. Martha Ambrose. Oh, she is? Martha Ambrose. Martha, come on down. Where are you? Oh, and I need to tell you this. The education committee is Carol McGinnis. And Wallace, Amro, that's us three, and all of these people. This is your education committee. They did, I'm sorry, they didn't get you. <laughs> Please forgive me, because they didn't know. <laughs> all right, let's bow for prayer, y'all. Our God, we thank you for this day as we come to worship you, and as we begin, we take the moment to pause and remember these faithful folks who prepared and uh, look into your word each week and open it to all of us so that we can learn and be better equipped to be your disciples. We thank you for these Sunday school teachers. We pray your blessings on their lives. Watch over them. Keep them in your care. Continue to give them the guidance and the wisdom they need. Help them to feel the equipping that you can provide and help them to know how much we appreciate them and thank them for their service to our church. We pray, God, that you'll continue to strengthen all of us through discipleship in our Sunday school. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, don't sit down too fast. Stand right back up and give some hugs and shake hands.
for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are, are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than, the, than human strength. Thank you, son. Well, it's good to see you this morning. Let's get those little red books we call the hymn book. Let's get them on out. Turn to 506. Hymn number 506. I will sing of my Redeemer, the first, second, and the last stand of John O'Cleese. And we sing. I'm going to be doing the mission moments today. I'm a poor substitute for Peggy Hemby, but I guess I'll have to do. <laughs> Proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. It's funny that I should get to read that verse. I'm a teacher. The need is great for churches in the north central region of the United States where there are a number of CBS supporters scattered throughout the region's 10 states, but few churches. Jorge Zazabon, CBF coordinator for the north central region, is currently involved in two church starts. Life of Faith, started by Michael Pimpo, is in Grays Lake, Illinois, and Sacred Space, started by Roland Cole, is in Round Beach, Illinois. Pray for these two new churches within the body of Christ. Ask God to open doors for more new churches in this region. Let's have a moment of silent prayer for these churches. A 
Amen. The offertory hymn for the morning, hymn number 529. Oh, how I love Jesus, 529. We're going to sing all four stanzas. You stand with us, please, as we sing. There is a name I love to hear. It's all about Jesus today.
few moments, I'll be reading from the Gospel of John in chapter 2, beginning verse 13. I wanted to uh, say how glad I am to see Courtney up on two legs. We're so happy to see you. I, I missed her in the front pew, though. But she's moved back a little bit, back to her regular old spot there. But seems to be improving and got the boots on her feet now. And you may have had this last week, but I was gone, so I don't know. This is your first Sunday with it. Okay. Well, we're happy that you're improving and healing up, and we continue to offer our prayers for you. And we got that big smile on her face, isn't it? Great. Uh, also, I want to remind you of a couple of things. We're going to meet with the travelers. Anybody interested in the traveling? Sometimes right after church, uh, up front here. So if you'd like to do that, we'll meet uh, before lunch. We'll make it quick. And then you may note in the bulletin that we're going to have a little fun a fundraiser of trying to pick the uh, NCAA basketball tournament. I have some brackets up front here. If you'd like to do that, it's five dollars to enter. And basically. It's just a fundraiser for our kids, and hopefully we'll raise enough to send at least one child uh, to their camp this summer uh, at Passport Kids. Uh, the idea is that we're just going to have fun with this. I used to do this in, t in Kentucky where they're all basketball crazy every year. Uh, in my church up there, all the men liked Kentucky and the ladies liked Louisville. So it was a very exciting basketball season for that group. Uh, basically, I've got the brackets, and they will come out tonight, and you just go through and pick them and probably somebody who knows nothing about basketball will win. And you'll see in there, there are some rules in the bulletin about how we need to do this uh, so children can be involved, but you know, we can't change our picks after the first round, right? <laughs> so we need to pick them first, and then hopefully you get it. You get a point for each round. It, it has it in there. Uh, the best thing is, if you're in the final four, you get prizes. Number four gets a uh, barbecue snack from Rocket. Uh, number three gets a meal from Cecil's. Uh, one and two get cakes or pies from Mary and Angie, which I can vouch are very good. Now, I've got, you know, four boys and me. We're all entering. That's five big chances for us to get a cake or pie from Mary uh, or Angie. But uh, I hope that y'all all do that. It's just going to be a fun thing. We'll keep the postings of our records uh, on the bulletin board uh, near the fellowship hall. Let's look now at our gospel reading in the Gospel of John in chapter 2. The Passover of the Jews was near... And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is God's word for us this morning.
Well, we certainly all wish Marilyn uh, continued to try to get better. She's got mono, uh, as many of you know, and she's going to be down for a while. Uh, we hope that she continues to improve and uh, has the rest that she needs. But I am impressed with the dexterity and the agility of these other folks who are playing the pianos. Uh, when I was coming in, Sean was moving benches around to get one that would fit. George was over here on my right at one moment, and I looked over here and realized he's already moved over here. Uh, it's amazing how quick these guys are. They're fast and agile, and it's pretty neat to know we've got, you know, folks on there. There, there he comes out of another door. <laughs> you know, so, man. You know, you like a staff that's quick on the feet, don't you? Uh, you may not know this term, but some of you probably do. It's called reductionism. Anybody ever heard that before? It's a theory related to the study of history. Reductionist theory basically says when you go back and study the events of the past, can you reduce it down and try to figure out the basic causes for those events, the basic reasons for it. A lot of times they'll look for an economic or a social cause that caused this event, this war, uh, an economic downturn, an election of a president, whatever, to happen. Can you reduce down the events and figure out the base cause or the base reason? Uh, religious historians have gone back and said, in their words, they want to look and see were there religious reasons uh, to cause the certain events that happened and the, the way the culture went uh, in that day and time. I think some people would reduce sermons the same way. They would ask preachers to... Uh, take a text of Scripture and reduce it down to its base and then sort of boil that up and say, okay, here are the, the basic causes, the basic message, the basic two or three things that you need to know out of the text of the Bible. I, I think that's probably a wrong-headed way to do that, although I have done that in, in the past and probably you are eager to hear that kind of thing. It makes it simpler. It's a lot easier to say, well, this is what Jesus meant, one, two, three, and then we all go home. But there's some texts of Scripture that are too thick for us to try to mess with reducing it down. And in that, by that I mean it's just too mysterious, too difficult to understand, and it has so many angles that you can't, you can't reduce it down to one or two things. In fact, you may go back to it over and over again in your life and find different messages for you from God over time based on the circumstances that you're in, the age that you have, and all those kinds of things. And I think this text is one of those thick texts. It's about the cleansing of the temple. Now, we have a guy on our church staff who's not here today, so I'm going to talk about him a little bit, Mike Duncan. Don't tell him, all right? But, you know, he loves this church so much, and I think he does an incredible job of cleaning the, the facilities that we have. In fact, if you drag your feet, we'll know about it because you scuff the floor, and, and Mike has told me many times about how many people in our church drag their feet, you know, because he's, he's buffing them out. Uh, if, you, if you drop some paper in the sanctuary, he knows where you sit, you know. He's making a list, checking it twice, and he knows who's naughty or nice. He's a great guy, and he, and he dusts and he cleans, and if I ever see a cobweb somewhere, you know, he's going to make sure that, that cobweb's taken, taken care of right then because he wants to clean it. In fact, one thing that I really enjoy doing periodically when I take a break from studying or something is unplugging the vacuum cleaner while he's vacuuming. And he's like, what's going on here? Now, I look, for everything that I do to him, there's ten more that happen back to me, okay? So he deserves all that. But what happened in this story of the cleansing of the temple with Jesus was not, was not as simple as somebody getting a bottle of Windex or a, a washcloth or pledge and a cloth and they're going to dust and clean up. This is a thick story about our Savior, Jesus Christ, taking some cords and wrapping them together in some way to make a whip and then coming into the temple courts and driving out people, money changers, overthrowing tables, and even running the animals, the cattle and the sheep, out of their pens. It's just a mass hectic day, wasn't it? It's a crazy day. And how do you boil that down? How do you sort of figure out what the message is of that story? What in the world was Jesus thinking and doing? Was he angry? Was he mad? Was he righteously indignant over what was happening? What was going on in that story? You know, it's interesting to me that the temple... The people of the temple had forgotten its base purpose. They had forgotten its purpose. In fact, one of the things he did, he didn't cleanse the whole thing necessarily. In other words, he didn't drive everybody out. What he did was a section of the temple. Back then, they had it all divided up. So if you were a really great person, you could come up really close to the altar of God. And then if you were, you know, different degrees of who you were. And finally, they had a section for Gentile people who were non-Jewish people. 
and you could come to a certain area, but they decided that they wanted this place to be so holy that you had to change your regular money that had pictures of George Washington or Jefferson Davis or somebody on it, you know. And you couldn't, you couldn't take whatever the picture was into the temple. And so they would change your money into stuff that had no graven image on it. And then they decided if you couldn't afford to bring your animal to sacrifice it to God, that's a long trip for some of us. And besides, most of us have blemished animals. We could have perfect animals right here waiting for you at church. You could, you know, buy one. And we'd charge you just a little bit. We've got to get folks to run that business. And Jesus noticed that the spot they took in the temple to have all the animals and the money changers was the spot where the Gentiles were supposed to go to worship. So what they did is they bumped the Gentiles out in order to make room for the money changers and the animals. And so it means, it, it means they pushed the Gentiles, and the message they sent was, you're about as far away from the altar of God as you can ever be, and that's where we want you. And Jesus comes in there and sort of turns all that stuff over. And you know, I think it's interesting that the people who are in charge did not ask him why. What in the world? Why are you doing this? I think they sort of knew. What they said was, well, what authority do you have to do this? They didn't ask him why he did it, but just what was the sign that you're doing this? What was the reason that you're doing this? And you know what Jesus said? He really didn't say, I'm destroying the temple. He said, you are destroying the temple. That's what he said. He said, destroy this temple, emphatically saying, you are destroying this house of worship and if you do that, I will rebuild it. And I'll do it in three days. Well, then there's another thick part of this, because they're all thinking it took 46 years and it's still in the building program part of it. And how in the world can you do that? John tells us that Jesus was talking about the temple of his body, which is the access we all have to worship God today, isn't it? Through Jesus Christ. I'm talking about myself. They didn't quite get that, only later when they reflect and they remember do they realize that that's what happened? Three days, died on the cross, and in three days, raised to life. It's a strange story, and it's sort of a hard story. Frederick Beekner said that there's no better proof for the existence of God than the way year after year he survives the way his friends treat him. It's sort of interesting, isn't it? And today I want you to think about that when we think about Jesus... We cannot reduce Jesus down to certain parts that we like. We can't just take the pieces of Jesus that we appreciate and that we feel good about or, more likely, the things that make us feel good. You know, people want to do that all the time to Jesus. They want to reduce him down and pick him apart. They want to take the piece of Jesus that they like, but not the Jesus that has a whip in his hand that is prophetic, that is prophesying in a prophetic, powerful way about the changes that must occur in the temple and in our lives, that is trying to challenge the limited viewpoints that we have about what God can do. It took 46 years, God. You can't do it in three days. And Jesus takes his whip and sort of drives and overturns that kind of stuff. So I want to ask you, what about your life? If Jesus were to come to you, what would he overturn? I mean, are you building or are you destroying? And if he comes to you, what would he drive out in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul? There's a little girl one time who was eating supper with her parents, and she had six green beans left on her plate. And her daddy said, you know, you've got to eat your vegetables. You need to eat these green beans. And she said, I'm full had enough. And he said, you know, it's just six green beans. You can't cram those things in there. No, I'm full. I've had my stomach's full. And he knew that her favorite dessert had been cooked by the mom. So he says, you know what? You got to eat that, those six green beans, in order to get dessert. It's like apple pie with ice cream on top. And she thought for a minute. She said, Daddy. And she stood up. And she said, this is my vegetable stomach. <laughs> and this is my meat stomach. And they're full. This is my dessert stomach, and it's empty, and I'm ready for dessert right now. <laughs> I have a big dessert stomach, by the way. I don't know about you, but I can be really full and still want dessert. But you know, that's sort of the way it is 
with Jesus for a lot of us. We want, some of us want the part of Jesus that is powerful, especially when we're in need. We want a strong, powerful God to protect us, to take care of our families, our children, our nation, our community. Or maybe we just want a, a, a Jesus who is really easy to talk to, a friend. We want somebody we can pray to. In fact, some of us probably don't pray to God much in general. We just pray to Jesus because He's friendly. We can talk to Him. We can see His face and we feel like He'll listen to us. Some of us want just the Savior part. I mean, there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians today who only know Jesus as their Savior. They got saved from hell and now they're going to heaven, but they don't do anything else in their lives to indicate that they are abiding in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to think about all the stories of the Bible. An incomplete, a part, piece, and parcel Jesus in your life is not enough. It's not good enough. It's not what Jesus demands or wants for you. There was a woman one time who just wanted to get the power of Jesus. You remember, he was walking through the crowd and she had a real physical problem and she touched him and she felt his power and she thought she was better. And Jesus stopped and he said, that's not good enough. You're not just getting my power to heal you when you're sick and you get to feel better. We want more from that. I want to call you out of this crowd because you are somebody. I want to name you. I want you to know that your God has known you, recognized you, and loved you. And I want to restore you back to your family and your church and your community. Because Jesus, just as a powerful healer, is not enough. There was a, a group of lepers one time, ten of them. You remember that story? And they all got healed of their skin disease that they had. And one of them came back to Jesus and said, Thank you. And Jesus asked the question, Wasn't there ten? Where are the other nine? Because gratitude, you know, getting stuff from Jesus is great. But what about worshiping Jesus? What about saying thank you, Jesus, for the things that you've experienced in your life? It's not enough to just get some parts of the gift without remembering the giver. There was a, a guy who was very rich and young, had a lot of stuff, and he came to Jesus and he said, you know what, I want to know how to get eternal life. I want to be saved. And Jesus said, well, there's some things you can do, but there's ultimately something really important you've got to do. You've got to follow and trust me. Well, he could do, he obeyed all the commands. In fact, he did better than anybody in this room, apparently. He didn't break any of the Ten Commandments. He'd never lied, never steal, never, never done anything wrong. And... When it came down to it, he walks away sad and rejected in a way because he only wanted a piece of God, a part of God. And a part of God is not enough. You have to have more than that. People today love picking Jesus apart. And I want to challenge you to think about what parts of Jesus you're relying on right now. What parts of Jesus do you tend to want and hang on to? And what parts do you ignore? And I want you to hear very clearly, I want you to hear very clearly, that picking Jesus apart is no way to be a follower of His. Picking Jesus apart is not good enough. It is not what He wants for you. It is not what He demands. He requires more than just being your rabbi, your teacher, your role model. He requires more than just being your Savior. He wants to be your Lord, your boss. He wants to command every bit of your life in a loving way, but He wants to be number one. Seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will work out. But if you don't put me first, there's a problem going on. There's a problem between us. If you continue to bump me down in priority, if you continue to only want a piece of me, you're going to miss the whole graciousness of why God sent me, of why God gave His only begotten Son so that we would have the whole story, the completeness. I've not come to do away, but to bring completeness, he said. Remember Thomas Jefferson is one of my favorite presidents, writer, all those kinds of things. And he studied the Bible a lot. He said you should read it in the original Greek, the New Testament. It's pretty, pretty profound. He was really into it. But he also didn't like some of it. And so he would edit out the parts he didn't like. He had Jefferson Bible. He would take out the parts he'd he didn't like. And I want to ask you, what parts do you not like? And what everybody sort of does is they take what they like and they tend to edit out what they don't like. So when God tells us, uh, if you'll just trust my son Jesus, then you get to go to heaven, a lot of us say, boom, I'll take that part. But what about the deny yourself and take up your cross daily? And what, how are you following Jesus? I mean, are you building, are you destroying your church, your family, and the friends that you're working with?
and playing with. What are you doing that's showing and evidencing that you are abiding in Jesus and so that your abiding in Jesus is producing fruit from Him? Because Jesus once said, by your fruit will people be able to know that you really are abiding in me, that you're grafted into the vine, that you're part of me. It's a prophetic act, this story of cleansing the temple. Because look, you can't come to church every Sunday and have somebody stroke you a little bit. You can't come to church every Sunday and have somebody say that God approves of your life, the way you're living it, and He affirms you in every way. You can't always just hear that stuff when sometimes Jesus must come cracking the whip to drive out and to overturn what is wrong with us in our lives. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us have messed up. But that does not mean that God approves of our falling short. What Jesus came to do was at times offer us those good things that we want, but He also intended to transform our lives. God intends us to be better husbands and better wives. He intends us to be better parents and better children, better employers and better employees. He intends us to be better Christians. He intends us to be better. And part of making us better is reproving us, correcting us, challenging us, and upturning the tables the way we operate, the stuff that we have inside of us, it will not always be that you can say, I want a gentle Savior like a shepherd leading me. I want the Jesus who lets little children sit in His lap. I mean, this day is not a day for your kids to run up and sit in Jesus' lap. He's got some prophetic work to be done. And sometimes Jesus will do that for you. If you pick out only the parts you like, you will miss the cleansing the cleansing of your life that God would bring to you. You know, we were talking in our Bible study on Tuesday about spiritual disciplines. And we've, we're looking at a lot of different ones. Some of them we practice a lot, some we don't. It's interesting to me that I, I feel like that you can't really feel like that you're doing the spiritual stuff in your life if you're only doing the easy stuff. I mean, if you just pray... And if you just read your Bible periodically, and if you just come to church, that's spiritual discipline. And you get some stuff out of that, I hope. But what about service? What about giving? What about study? You know, we talked about Sunday school today. What about studying the Word? What about getting involved in it in such a way that you're feeling the transformation of your life? What about laying yourself before God in confession and asking God to turn over what needs to be turned over in you? The attitudes, the prejudice, the sinful thoughts, all of those kinds of things that happen to you. You know, good coaches, I've noticed, are good to their players and they, seem, they, they seem to care for them. In fact, I've seen it over and over again from high school to college where good coaches create a loyalty so that their, their students, their players, they would almost do anything for that coach. And they play for the team. They play for more than just themselves. They play for the coach. They play for each other because they've been molded in a such, a, such a way that sometimes that coach will notice them and sort of hug them and encourage them and take care of them. But a good coach also knows there are times for correction because a player that's always doing something the wrong way needs to be told that's wrong. And you need to change. And we're going to change the way you're doing things in your life. A good coach sometimes will forcefully get up in your face and confront you with what you're doing wrong and how it needs to be corrected in order to do it the proper way. Jesus would heal the wounds of our lives, people. But part of the healing process, like a surgeon that must be welcomed to our lives, part of the healing of our wounds is allowing Jesus to come in as the great physician, even if he carries a whip, and confronting us with our own sinfulness that continues to keep the wounds going. 
I mean, I think, if you consider this, I think that most of the wounds that really hurt us are not physical. They are emotional and they are spiritual. And they hamper us and they are continued on down the line in our families. Jesus would heal those things. But if you only want a Jesus who's just going to love on you, is only going to just forgive you all the time, if you only want a Jesus who can sit in his lap, you're going to miss the prophetic Jesus who will change, transform your life. I think it's often in, in remembering God and reflecting on God in your life that you sort of get that. And you sort of say, you know what, I was picking him apart a little bit. I'm just taking parts of him. That's one of the reasons I think Sunday school is so important. When you're in Sunday school, you have the opportunity to be with a few people, and you have the opportunity to hear other people's opinions and voices. Because if you're just by yourself all the time, you can fool yourself very easily, can't you? You can sort of come up with your own ideas and think this is what it means. You know, there's a place that talks about iron sharpening iron. And I think for me that's what the community of study, deep study in the Bible is about. It's people sharing their lives over time, not only caring for you when you need, but allowing you to open the thickness of the text of Scripture and having the opportunity to hear what other people think about it and then consider that and allow the Spirit to work in community. And I think that's a lot of way, you know, sometimes when you have the accountability of a people like that, it, it keeps you more on track, doesn't it? It keeps you more faithful. And I think that's one of the reasons that we need to have people more involved in Sunday school. People prefer the Savior part. They prefer the gentle shepherd. They prefer the, the Jesus that lets little kids sit in their lap. But there is an exception to that, I think. When you're in trouble and when somebody's done you wrong, we tend to want to say, Jesus, get that whip out, don't we? Jesus, get that whip and go sick them. Jesus, get that whip of cords and get all the principalities and all the powers that have amassed against me in my life, and I want you to go get them. They need judgment. They need punishment. They need godly correction. We do that. And I'll give you an example. Many of us now, because of the problems in our country, we want to say to Jesus, Jesus, get that whip of cords and go sick those politicians that got us in this mess. Lord, go sick those CEOs in their private planes. We like to do that, don't we? Lord, get that whip of, of cords and go sick those people who overborrowed with no collateral. Shouldn't they have known better? And they've got us in this mess for doing this. Lord, get all those stock swindlers and the tax dodgers. I see it all the time. Lord, get your whip and do that. Whatever happened to E Pluribus Unum? Out of many, one. I mean, I, I think I would say to you that sometimes when Jesus has a whip of cords, he's making a space for you. He's driving the animals out so you can come back and be restored to the community of the faithful. But sometimes you and I need to have Jesus enter into the temple of our hearts with a whip of cords and overturn and drive out what needs to be overturned and what needs to be driven out in our lives. You and I must accept the reproof of God. We must accept that there are things terribly wrong with all of us. It is caused by our own sinfulness. Let those who have never had an opportunity to overcharge on their credit cards cast the first stone. Let those who have not lied a little bit cast the first stone. Let those who have never had lust in their hearts a little bit, cast the first stone. Let those who have never coveted, those who have never lied, those who have never uttered careless words, cast the first stone. Let those who have, who have never been the ones to be silent when a fit word could have made all the difference in somebody's life, cast the first stone. I want you to imagine Jesus coming in to the sanctuary today. <clears throat> I want you to imagine Jesus coming into the sanctuary of your heart. And I want you to imagine what he would do if he loves you so much that he would drive out what is hurting you, what is wrong with you, what is not holy in you. I want you to imagine 
what it is that God would overturn. If He loves you enough to do it, what would He overturn in your life today? We need all of Jesus, not just a part of Jesus. And in the season of preparing for Easter we call Lent, we need to know a Jesus who doesn't just speak to us or speak for us. We also need a Jesus who will speak against us at times because we are all part of the problem that put Jesus on the cross in the first place. When I was 16 years old, a volcano erupted in the United States. I never thought that that would happen. I have some of the, the ashes and the dust in a little, little medicine bottle that my aunt brought me from Mount St. Helens. Now remember that? 1980. The blast was like a nuclear bomb going off. It was felt and heard for 600 miles. Uh, about maybe 50, 60, 70 people were killed. You remember, there was a guy who had a house. I remember that very clearly. You know, they rescued some folks, though, who were camping in the mountain area near there, who were only a mile away from ground zero of the blast. And you know, they, they interviewed all these folks. They didn't hear a thing. It's amazing. Somehow the way the blast went, there was a zone of silence just right up near the mountain. And they said, you know what, if you weren't looking right at it, you wouldn't even known it happened until all of a sudden it got dark. I don't know where you're standing. You might be real close to Jesus, you think. You might be really far off from Jesus. It really doesn't matter, does it? Jesus came one day and said, I will destroy this temple. I will rebuild it. I will build it again in three days. And he did it. And the only way that you and I can experience the fullness of his salvation for our lives is to allow ourselves to accept every bit of Jesus. Don't pick him apart. Sometimes the best thing for your life is to allow Jesus to come in with a whip in his hand. Amen. Well, what I want to do today for an opportunity for us to respond is to allow you just to remain where you are. If you feel led to come forward, I certainly want you to do that. And maybe you even want to come up here and pray. If you want to talk with me, that's great. We invite you to do that. Join our church, anything like that. But for many, many more of us, this is an opportunity for us just to simply say to God, I want to unfold my life to you right now. In this time, while the musicians are playing, and I want to confess whatever needs to be confessed because I need your prophetic work in my life. I need you to come in and cleanse me, to overturn what needs to be overturned, because I desire you, God, and I desire to be better. I want to be better for you. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. So if you would, just remain seated. If you feel led to come forward, we invite you to do that. Bow your heads and close your eyes, and just in these moments, say whatever it is you need to say to God. Unfold your heart, your soul, your spirit, all about you to the Lord this morning, and let him speak to you, if he will, during this time. Thank you very much. Let me close with a word of prayer today, and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Remember, we have a meal waiting for you here for our youth, and if you have anybody that needs to help serve, they need to go. We're all ready. We're good. Okay, good. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our God, we come before you asking you to continue to bless each one of us in our lives. We do certainly love the sweet Jesus that we adore. We are so thankful for his saving us on the cross. But we also pray and ask you that you would open our lives, Lord, and help us to be cleansed of whatever needs to be cleansed from us. Overturn it. Drive it out, Lord. We want to be better for you. We want to be the best we can be for you. We want to be better people. And we pray, God, that you would help us do that because we can't do it by ourselves. 
We need your prophetic word to come to us, to touch us, and to convict us. And in our conviction, Lord, whether we've rebelled against you, whether we're doing things that are wrong right now, whether we have thoughts in us that shouldn't be there, whatever they are, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us of those sins. And we are mindful that on the cross when you died, you said you would offer forgiveness to us. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And we trust you in that, Lord. So we're opening ourselves to you in our private places and ask God that you bless each one of us with your prophetic word. Drive it out, Lord. Cleanse us and make us whole because we need all of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay.